All right, so I'm going to do my best here. Uh, I apologize for the, uh, again, I apologize for the delay. I'm um, having a couple technical challenges, but um, what I'll do is I'll just do my best with what I have, and hopefully you can see it. Um, my name is Matthew Fredrickson, and I am the, uh, the open source project lead for the Astros Project. And uh, I'm really, really glad to be here. This is the first time I've spoken at FOSDEM. Uh, some of my predecessors have done that, but, or, or have been here and have talked a little bit about Asterisk, but this is the first time I've done it. Um, I just want to start off and ask a quick question. How many of you have used Asterisk before? If I raise a hand. That's good. That's good. I, I was like thinking about my talk and how I wanted to do it, and I wasn't sure how to target towards my audience and, and who they're going to be. All right, so um, that's, that's comforting to hear. Um, so most of you are probably familiar with what asterisk is in the background and things like that. Um, I thought that that was probably a pretty safe assumption, and so I, I'm not going to go into a lot of details on that. But mostly what I'd like to do is kind of cover a few things about what's going on with the asterisk project. So um, just as some background, um, I, uh, I started doing this a couple of years ago. My name is Matthew Fredrickson, and uh, Matt Jordan, for those of you who remember him, was my predecessor. Um, who led the Asterisk project, and he got the opportunity to move around within Digium, the company that sponsors Asterisk, um, and to uh, kind of move into a more oversight role within the company as a CTO. And with that, they, they needed somebody to step in and to be able to take care of the day-to-day -day management and running the Asterisk project, and they asked me to do that. Um, I've worked at Digium uh, since about 2001 and as a, in de various developmental capacities doing lots of different things. Uh, I've worked on Digium's hardware. For those of you that um, go really far back and, and use uh, Asterisk in a, in a hardware environment with old uh, ISDN cards or analog cards and things like that, I worked a lot on the hardware, uh, specifically the device drivers and design of that hardware as well. Um, I, through the years, I maintained a lot of the, uh, the telephony interfaces within Asterisk, the traditional telephony interfaces like the DOTI channel driver or the Zaptel channel driver. Um, I maintained the Zaptel or the Dotty kernel device drivers and things like that and, and extended those and improved those and, and things of that nature. I also made, maintained libpri, which is the ISDN uh, stack for asterisk. For those of you that remember what ISDN is, I guess every, you know, ISDN is kind of going away uh, in a lot of places. Um, and then I, at some point uh, a, few, a number of years ago, I realized that there was no SS7 or C7 stack for Asterisk. So you couldn't talk to really big phone switches and things like that directly. And I thought that that was a shame. Uh, you know, I had really had a strong passion in my heart for old dead telephony protocols. And I felt that, that Asterisk would not be complete without uh, being able to talk directly to an SS7 switch or C7 switch. And so I decided to start working on an SS7 stack for Asterisk, which was called libs 7 um, I got pulled out of dead telephony land for uh, uh, probably, about four, probably about five or six years ago now to go work on some new world WebRTC related initiatives as the, the technology started to percolate and to become more interesting. And uh, so Digim wanted to build some tools and infrastructure related to WebRTC, and I got to be able to do that, and that was really a lot of fun, kind of uh, turning my face a little bit more forward. Um, and after that, they asked me uh, to, uh, to manage the Astro Project, and that was about two years ago. And so uh, it's been an honor, and it was, uh, it's been very exciting to be able to work with all the really smart people, not just at Digium, but all over the world, who, uh, who consider it to be valuable to, the, valuable to themselves and to those around them to donate their time to to work on that project and extend it, things like that. So um, I'll talk a little bit more today about a little bit of history. Um, if you'll remember, uh, I, actually, let me ask a question. How many of you used Asterisk when it was in its 1.0 version? Oh, man, that's more hands than I expected, actually. That's really good. All right, so it was a really long time ago. You know, that was probably early 2000s. Uh, it was quite a few years ago. Um, it actually was, it was surprisingly feature at least spec wise complete right it had like isdn support it had which back then that was very important um it had h223 support it had mgcp mgcp support it had a sip channel driver um it had some programming interfaces that we still use today like the agi and ari interfaces for doing you know application based programming with asterisk so you know it was a surprisingly you know well rounded version of asterisk right and you know you could look at it and say, well, you know, we could just stop right there. But, you know, obviously progress doesn't stop. Um, and so we moved forward and, and did a lot of things to it. And eventually the 1.6 version came out, um, which included 
not just support for old school eight kilohertz, you know, narrow band telephony, but we decided that we wanted to extend the core of Asterisk to support wide band telephony. So your calls sound a lot better, and you can hear the difference between different, you know, consonant sounds and things like that better, and, and the quality is better. Um, obviously, since I implement SS7 support, um, I feel a shameless obligation to plug that that was the version that we merged in SS7 support into Asterisk. Um, and then some more time passed. Um, and we had many more versions and things happen. These are just some highlights, but Asterisk 11 came out and it, was, it had the beginnings of WebRTC support, which is kind of the next big thing in, in I, I would say, the, the real-time communication space in the last few years. Um, and so we started to implement that in the SIP channel driver, to be able to extend the SIP channel driver to, to uh, interoperate with browsers and things like that that support WebRTC. Um, Asterisk 12, we decided that the SIP channel driver that we've been using for like 13 years or whatever it had been um, had gotten to the point where it was very difficult to work on. Um, it got to the point where we, where we tried to make changes. We tried to fix a bug or something like that. And it was, it was built in such a way and it had, it had not been um, redesigned in, in such a way that it was easier to work on it, that we, you know, if you tried to fix a bug, you end up creating like three or four more. Um, that was very, it was, it was to the point where we were not happy working on it, and we decided to take a step back and to write a new SIP channel driver that was better architected and better suited for extendability and for changing and for bug fixing, and it had a better, um, from the get-go, better tested implementation. And so we did that, and that's where the PJ SIP channel driver came from. It's based on the PJ project SIP stack, and, um, you know, it's worked very well. Um, we, in Astros 13, we added a new interface called the REST, ARI REST interface, because RESTful interfaces are very popular. They make a lot of sense, and they're, uh, you know, from a programming perspective, a lot, and that's kind of where the industry was going, so we built a REST interface for Asterisk. We did some more work on the PJ SIP channel driver as well. In Astros 14, um, which was the previously released version of Asterisk, included more ARI improvement, so more fleshing out of APIs and capabilities that you could do with the REST interface in controlling Asterisk, more PJSIP improvements, and we moved asynchronous DNS into the core of Asterisk, which is, which is a good thing for a lot of people. So Asterisk 15, that's what I want to talk about. That was the most recently released version of Asterisk, which was in October at Astrocon. Um, so we kind of looked at kind of where things were going and what Asterisk had been doing. And, and Asterisk is, lives in this land which, is, which merges old and new worlds, right? That's kind of where it gave its birth, is you could connect to really old telephony protocols and you could merge them with new world telephony protocols. Like, you know, in early 2000s, that was maybe talking ISDN or something like that and then be able to connect it to a SIP call or even an HP23 call, which, you know, now is, seems like, you know, dinosaur technology. But... Uh, uh, but, you know, that's kind of where Asterisk has lived. And we, we kind of realized that we, there was a space that we needed to fill in terms of bridging these old and new worlds, again, with Asterisk and video. And Asterisk actually has had video support for a very long time. Um, it just, it's been uh, limited, and there have been some areas where, you know, given how the market has changed and, and the requirements of people for applications have changed, um, we decided that there needed to be some changes within the core of Asterisk as well to, to be able to keep up with that market. And so, um, you know, traditionally you'll have this kind of single video experience. I'm going to try to be quick because I'm a little bit late. Um, but this, it's called the MCU experience where you have, you know, a, a, a central mixing box for video conferencing. And you'll have a box and what it does, it takes everybody's video streams and then it, it decompresses them and then it mixes them all together into square or something like that. And then it'll re-encode it and send it back out, right? And that, you know, seems like it worked for a very long time. And actually, it still works for some use cases. There are some cases where that's a better um, environment or better situation to do. But, you know, with all the really cool browsers that came out, you know, the browser technology with WebRTC and things like that, um, they, they brought this really awesome new client that you could do things that really um, traditionally you had like proprietary client and, you know, somewhat proprietary client, somewhat proprietary mixer or full proprietary, right? And the browser kind of brought this really programmable open client that you could do really cool things that weren't really possible before. And so, um, you know, the MCU experience works, but it doesn't allow you to build really rich client experiences in the browser, right? Um, because that, that video experience is fixed for the most part. Um, 
And so we realized that you know this is an area we wanted to improve upon and, and do some things better. And so what we did with Asterisk 15 is we started to remove some of the limitations that that kept Asterisk where it was. Previously in an Asterisk video conference, it was a video switching experience. So you had multiple video streams coming in from different participants, and it would switch between whoever the active talker was. And you'd, the, everybody in the conference would receive a single stream, and it would be a switching experience. And um, so we kind of, we took some of those limitations out. We decided that was a limitation we wanted to get rid of um, to be able to support some of these new conferencing experiences. Um, we allowed renegotiation of, of video streams and things like that in the core of Asterisk and uh, to be able to, you know, dynamically add and remove streams on a call session and things like that. That was kind of a requirement. And then we added some support for, uh, in the conferencing application, to not just do video switching, but to be able to do um, simultaneous showing of all video streams at the same time. So everybody in the, in the, in the conference uh, was allowed to receive everybody else's stream at the same time, as long as the client permitted that. Much like uh, what uh, Janice and uh, some of the other uh, video projects do as well. And so that, that experience is called a, a selective forwarding unit experience. And if you see my diagram, kind of the way it works, so if you see each of the browsers, they're sending one video stream back to asterisk, and then each one's receiving two more back, and that's the other participants. And so you can imagine that that is a really, you can do some really neat things with that. So if you're a client um, and you're watching a presentation, let's say one of those, and you have two streams coming in, and one's the presentation, the head, the person, the head of the person talking, and one's, say, the slide feed from the presentation. Um, as a client, let's say you as an individual are watching the conference and you like to take notes with your hands, and you're watching that slide feed. And, you know, in a, in a fixed experience where the client didn't have access to both those streams, that if, if the presenter decided, okay, I want, I want to swap back to my head instead of, I'm done with this slide, everybody else better be done with it, swap, back, swap the feedback to my head, that, that's kind of what you get. But uh, with an SFU type experience, you have access to both streams and you as, you as a, a participant can say, I, no, I want, to, I want to hold on to the slide stream longer so I can finish writing my notes and things like that. So you have the ability to make a lot more powerful, from a client perspective, experiences with, with the SFU environment, which is... Um, which is really compelling. So anyway, that's, that's kind of what we did with Asterisk is, is we took that approach and we tried to uh, make, the, uh, make Asterisk into a, uh, a video selective forwarding unit. So um, let's see. I'm going to talk a little bit more about some other things in Asterisk 15. Um, but if you'd like to, um, to play around with the SFU support and things like that, they're on the Asterisk GitHub rep repo. Um, we have a sample client, a browser-based client that you can download, and you can hook it up to Asterisk and things like that and see, you know, you can connect your friends to it and everybody can see each other and wave at each other at the same time and things like that. It's, it's really fun to do, uh, to see. Um, I'm going to talk just a couple minutes about some of the general improvements in Asterisk 15. Okay, I've got to get moving quicker. All right, so this is just going to have to be really quick. But we've, we had a number of platform improvements in Asterisk 15. Improvements for GCC 7, uh, build fixes for FreeBSD, build fixes for the herd, which uh, was pretty cool to see because I, I hadn't done anything personally with the herd in many years. Um, there's a, a Limbic support for MS SQL, which is our uh, database migration layer, Limbic, that we use. Um, and then the PJ project, for those of you that build Asterisk currently, um, it's, it's downloaded and built by default as part of the, the build process. So you don't have to go and um, find it and things like that. Um, we also have uh, some new sounds for Asterisk. We added uh, the 2.0 uh, OAuth protocol for XMP mo Motif, the channel driver there. We added, uh, we merged in some patches that were contributed by a gentleman called named Dennis Gousset, and, and uh, there's another gentleman, I think, in Berlin that also worked on that, but he, to do uh, stereo support in the ConfBridge application. So if you have an endpoint that supports stereo audio, you can listen and you can have people positionally be in different places in the conference and you can hear it being in different positions. It's kind of neat. Um, there's some more debug utilities. We added support for some more WebRTC technologies that were necessary uh, as part of our SFU support, like RTCP Max, um, VP9 codec pass through, uh, you know, some convenience options for setting up WebRTC and things like that. Um, 
We also added support for a technology that we've been really holding out on with Asterisk, which is called Bundle, um, which is a, a technology used in the browser to multiplex audio and video streams over the same socket and the same uh, RTP session. And uh, that was something that we, uh, we needed to do to do a lot of the video things. So um, just as a quick heads up, for Astro 16, you may be wondering what's coming out. I apologize it's so brief, but I think my time got eaten up by technology stuff. But uh, some of the goals for Astro 16 are is we're going to continue to flesh out Astro SFU APIs. So from an AR REST API uh, perspective, being able to control Astro better um, with you know, REST and things like that, and be able to manipulate and change the, mutate the conference experience that you're having. Um, we're planning on improving Astro's video resiliency uh, in poor network environments. So we discovered that uh, after we did the SFU support that um, there were some technologies that made the experience a lot better when there was high packet loss and bad Wi-Fi networks and things like that. So we're working on some of those. Um, and then we're going to be continuing to improve the PJSIP performance. And so um, I think that's pretty much it as far as my time goes. I don't want to run over and take much time. Um, there was some really, uh, is Alexander Trout here? Did he come this morning? Okay, there are a few contributors that contribute to the Astros. I always try to give props and shout out to them, but it looks like maybe um, these, they're, Astros is a huge project. Lots of people contribute to it. There's a lot of statistics and things like that. I can't understate how big it is and how much it is to, uh, how, how many people are involved and things like that, but I always try to uh, recognize them. Um, so just as a reminder, um, if you're running Astros 11, it's time to get off of it. <laughs> it's end of life, like as of last year, like in October, November. Um, that means it doesn't receive security fixes anymore. So if you're running it on a public network, you don't want to do that, right? Um, so uh, Astros 15 was released at the same time. So get forward onto either Astros 13, which is the, the current LTS, or 15, which is the current, you know, most recently released version. Um, just as a heads up, typically the odd versions of Astros releases become LTSs. Astros 15 is an exception. We changed it. Because of all the video work we did, we decided to wait to make, Astros, uh, make a new Astros LTS release until Astros 16 instead. And so this presumably next, this year in October, Astros 16 will be LTS. Um, anyway, thank you very much. Sorry to take so much of your time. Um, uh, if you have any questions, feel free to come afterwards and ask me because I don't want to take too much of the next speaker's time.